For the first time in history, a French president visits the United States. On the liner Ile de France, President Vincent Oriol, accompanied by Mrs. Oriol and Foreign Minister Robert Schumann, arrives in New York, where he's greeted by Frederick Bartholdi's Statue of Liberty, given by France to her sister republic, the United States. Oriol and his party hurry to Washington, where in Union Station they're welcomed by President and Mrs. Truman. The ride through Washington, itself a symbol of French and American friendship, for it was designed by a French architect, takes the two presidents past a quarter of a million cheering Washingtonians. Reviewing a parade in his honor, Oriol pledges that his country will continue to take her place beside America in the battle for liberty, just as she has since 1776. In New York, ending his American visit, Oriol decorates Mayor Impelitary and concludes with a traditional ceremonial kiss, which makes such a big hit with the photographers that they beg Monsieur Oriol for an encore. And the French president winds up his visit in a blaze of goodwill. In Europe's uneasy spring, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, commander of the Atlantic Pact Army, is greeted by British staff officers as he inspects important elements of his newly formed defense force. At Zennelager, British-occupied zone, Eisenhower is in Germany for the first time since taking command. Ike goes to the British training grounds to observe field exercises of the 91st Brigade, despite a late spring spell of foul weather. Since this area may, in the event of a Russian drive to the Atlantic, be the actual battleground, Eisenhower is determined to whip his forces into top shape. He next flies to Koblenz, in the French-occupied zone of Germany, for conference with top French generals Chomel and Guillaume. The French 3rd Division, also part of Ike's new European army, goes into maneuvers. Pioneer troops equivalent of our engineers throw up a bridge in record time as Eisenhower watches. United West European forces take important realistic steps to guard against aggression. By President Truman, recalling General Douglas MacArthur from his command, sets off one of the most dramatic and controversial news stories of the generation. In Tokyo, thousands of Japanese flock to the Daiichi Building, the Supreme Allied Headquarters, to see the 71-year-old five-star general as he enters his headquarters for the last time. The next morning, a plane from Korea brings to Tokyo the new Supreme Commander, General Matthew Ridgway, named by Truman to replace MacArthur. The changes in command keep Tokyo's Haneda Airport busy. Lieutenant General James A. Van Fleet arrives from Washington en route to Korea to succeed Ridgway as commander of the 8th Army. Now the recalled Supreme Commander arrives at the airport for his trip home after a farewell ride past a quarter of a million cheering Japanese. General and Mrs. MacArthur say goodbye to American and Japanese friends. Then in the General's plane, the Bataan head for the homeland they've not seen in 14 years. After a brief stopover in Hawaii, the Bataan brings the MacArthurs to a hero's homecoming in San Francisco. For the first time since 1935, MacArthur sets foot on the soil of the continental United States. The next morning, half a million San Franciscans hail the general as accompanied by Mayor Robinson and Governor Warren, he goes on a two-hour tour of the city. Then MacArthur heads for Washington to keep his scheduled appointment before Congress. The next day, after a non-stop flight to Washington, MacArthur arrives at the Capitol, where he's welcomed by prolonged cheers from the joint meeting of Congress. 
In a dramatic and impassioned speech, MacArthur defends his Far East policies and then closes on a personal note. I am closing my 52 years of military service. When I joined the army, even before the turn of the century, it was the fulfillment of all my boyish hopes and dreams. The world has turned over many times since I took the oath on the plane at West Point, and the hopes and dreams have long since vanished. But I still remember the refrain of one of the most popular barrack ballads of that day, which proclaimed most proudly that old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballot, I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. That afternoon, all Washington turns out to pay tribute to MacArthur, who heads the parade in a car with his wife, Jean Marie, and son, Arthur. Schools have been let out, and business and government offices closed in his honor. The celebration reaches its climax at the Washington Monument, where a vast throng hails MacArthur, who then goes on to New York. In New York on the following morning, the tumultuous welcome continues. Two out of every three New Yorkers, including four million visitors, a total of seven and a half million people, turn out to give MacArthur the noisiest reception ever received by anyone as he tours the city. A blizzard of confetti, ticker tape, and torn paper, which eventually reaches a total of over 3,000 tons, cascades on MacArthur along his 19-mile route. turns uptown along Fifth Avenue, where on each block an estimated 5,000 people are jammed shoulder to shoulder. Young Arthur enjoys his share of the welcome, too. Americans of all political opinions, differing though they may on issues raised by MacArthur's recall, join in giving an old soldier and a great one, General of the Army Douglas MacArthur, a hero's welcome to the United States. unassuming buildings at Chalk River, set in a corner of the Ontario bush country, some of Canada's top scientists are bombarding the atom in a $5 million atomic pile, the most powerful of its kind in the world. Inside a huge concrete cylinder, billions of neutrons move at speeds up to 10,000 miles per second, producing new materials that even now are radically changing the 20th century world. One such product is the Cobalt-60 isotope, on which Chalk River Administrator Dr. D.A. Keyes and his assistants are working. The Cobalt-60 isotope is an important factor in peacetime radiography for X-ray pictures and studies of the sun. And the Chalk River plant is the only one which can produce such cobalt. Much of this work, of course, is secret and cannot be photographed. Although the plant can be converted to war needs and has helped speed the H-bomb in American plants, the Chalk River atomic pile is planned for peace, producing aids to agriculture, medicine, science, and industry. Spring is 
surely hear when the circus comes to town. The Ringling Brothers open with a star-studded benefit for the Hart Fund. Fulfilling everybody's secret ambition, Jack Dempsey joins the clowns for a night. And now, Lou Jacob presents a compressed preview of his 1958 model car, small enough to solve any city parking problem. a voice from the audience, Jimmy Durante. You know, I was downstairs, and I seen one of them elephants looking at a little mouse. And the elephant was saying to the mouse, look at the size of me and look at the size of you. Why, you're nothing but a wretched, insignificant little shrimp. The little mouse looked up at the elephant and said, listen, I've been sick. <laughs> Let me take the pictures, come on. As the thrills come thick and fast, wire-walking wonder Hubert Castle goes into his act on a taut steel thread. In a unique feat of balance, Leone startles the crowd on his swaying pole. Benito Del Oro takes to the air on a flying trapeze. The death-defying aerialists sail through the air, thrilling kids, young and old, all over America. The prodigious, wonderful, and astounding circus is back. Ben Hogan, teeing off in the Masters Tournament at Augusta, set his sights on one of professional golf's greatest prizes. But Ben seems jinxed never to take the coveted Masters, as he loses a heartbreaking playoff against a near-record 280 score by Byron Nelson. Hogan's career seemed at its peak with his 1948 PGA victory over Mike Ternisa. Soon afterward, Hogan was almost fatally injured in an automobile accident. The brilliant skill with which he made shots like this over Ternisa's stymie seemed lost to golf forever. In the U.S. Open at Ardmore, Pennsylvania, a year following his accident, although doctors had predicted he would never walk again, Hogan gains a triple tie for first, outplaying a field of golfing's greatest. Now, with iron control, Hogan seeks the final playoff putt to win from Lloyd Mangum and George Fazio. Hogan's comeback is successful, and is Mrs. Hogan proud of the new U.S. Open champion? Hogan now has his eye on the Masters, the only major U.S. tournament he has never won. Starting out in the last round of the 1951 Masters, one stroke behind Ski Regal and Sammy Sneed, Hogan thrills the crowd of 10,000 with powerful shots and brilliant putting. Meantime, Regal has come in with a 282. The crowd is tense. Can Hogan beat Regal? He has only to sink the next putt to win. And sink it he does for a winning 280, one stroke over the record. As Regal watches, Hogan is congratulated by Bobby Jones as he adds the Masters crown to a brilliant golf career. Philadelphia Zoo, oldest in the country, tries an experiment in its new birdhouse. It's opened its cages so that birds and humans can mingle without the interference of wire, glass, or netting. The birds seem to like it. As for the humans, they can stare at a South American lapwing just as if they were alone with it in the jungle. And the cock of the rock doesn't mind visitors at all. A golden-fronted bulbul is perfectly at home on a familiar azalea bush. And any bird is free to supervise from a perch on the cameraman's shoulders as he photographs a flock of Victoria Crown pigeons from New Guinea, largest pigeons in the world.
This pair of rare Indian hornbills who have a seven foot wing spread resemble the Brazilian toco toucans with their eight inch beaks. Another of the 51 exotic species who mingle with tourists and sightseers is the mot mot, common to Central America. One of the favorites is the American hummingbird whose freewheeling maneuvering skill as he hovers over the Avery Pond surpasses that of a helicopter. Shorebirds, among them black-necked stilts and European oyster catchers, live in an authentic background of sand and driftwood. I've been on my feet all day. Lebanon, Connecticut, with its scattered white houses, hardly seems to have aged since the days of the Revolution. Its livestock in rock-walled pastures, its orderly barns, mark Lebanon, like many another American town, as a farming community. In some ways unchanged since the day Lebanon patriots left on foot to fight at Bunker Hill, Lebanon seems timeless. In other ways, the town is always growing with the restless energy of America. Much to its own surprise, Lebanon recently found itself the center of worldwide curiosity. For in the State Department's International Publications Division, artists and writers were at work on a pamphlet which in photographs and 51 foreign languages is telling people all over the world, even behind the Iron Curtain, about life in Lebanon, an American community in action. The Trumbull Library reaffirms Lebanon's connection with the past, a democratic past, founded, as America's fathers stated, on a belief in God, whether worshipped in a Baptist church, a simple synagogue, formerly a schoolhouse, whose rabbi is a Lebanon farmer, or a Catholic church, built a few years ago in an historically Protestant area. In early times, Lebanon's religious life centered around the Congregational Meeting House, designed by a son of the famous Jonathan Trumbull, who was governor of Connecticut during the Revolution. From here, Governor Trumbull and his four sons participated in revolutionary activities from Boston to Valley Forge. A tunnel ran to the war office, where with Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, Lafayette, and many others, they planned for America's freedom. With these democratic traditions forming a background of their lives, Lebanon's young people are conscious of their part in a world still fighting for freedom. With New England pride in craftsmanship, boys and girls alike learn to work with their hands. Such training is as much a part of education for their role in community life as geography or arithmetic or history. In their new elementary school, which replaces seven one-room buildings scattered throughout the countryside, the younger children of Lebanon are discovering the international counterpart of the traditional New England town meeting. Through a United Nations session in miniature, they can see the selfishness of one nation threaten the harmony and order of the democratic process and the security of other nations. The setting is homemade, but the lesson is real. The people of Lebanon come from many groups. Some are descendants of early settlers. Others, like the Vincent McBride family, are newcomers. Mr. McBride, an electrical engineer, and his wife have followed the example of early settlers in joining with their neighbors in a full community life. To a world beset by anxiety, Lebanon, with its balance of tradition and progress, stands as an example of democratic life. <laughs> 